thank you to Rabbi Mizrahi for coming here tonight. Um, I just want to say a few things. In case, uh, well, Rabbi, in case you didn't know, you have a substantial fan club here in South Florida. <laughs> Many of us here, including myself, feel very much like we know you, like we've known you for years. And the truth is, this is the first time we're meeting. <laughs> the reason why we feel so connected to the rabbi is because of the wonderful Torah lectures that he has posted online through his CDs that have given us hours and hours of inspiration. On a personal note, um, a friend of mine introduced me to the CDs and the Shirim of Rabbi Mizrahi about eight months ago. Um, he gave me the CD and it had like 15 hours of Torah classes on it. I did not think I would listen to them. But, believe it or not, I do a lot of driving and the rabbi's lectures are very easy to listen to. They're very um, edgy. They're very informative, educational. And at the end of the day, it gave me a personal chizuk, and I believe that for a lot of people here, they feel the same way. Um, in particular, a special hakarat a special appreciation we have for the women of the community who have benefited tremendously from the rabbi's CDs. Um, my wife, for example, is able to listen to the rabbi's shirim in her car, which is something that I've never seen her do before. Um, it actually was an accident. I left one of my CDs in her car after a trip to Orlando. And the next day she comes and says, who's that rabbi that's in the car? And he was the funny, funny jokes and the accent and, <laughs> and the, uh, and, you know, <laughs> the rabbi is very, very um, unique in the way he presents himself and the way he pre presents his, his, uh, his Torah lectures. Um, I don't know if it's the accent, I don't know if it's the, if it's the jokes, I don't know if it's the spicy way he delivers, but ultimately as a package he does an excellent job and that's the reason that he's followed by so many worldwide. Um, for those who've never heard Rabbi Mizrahi, if this is your first time, just a little background information. I would consider Rabbi Mizrahi to be one of the premier leading um, Hebrew rabbis today in the world. Although there are a lot of organizations who are experts in Kiruv, Rabbi Mizrahi is a league of his own, with his own style, his own, his own method of, uh, his own method. Basically, the rabbi's motto, so to speak, is that if he can prove, without a shadow of a doubt, that the Torah is divine, that the Torah is from Hashem, with no human involvement, if he can prove it by answering questions, by bringing proofs in scripture, by bringing proofs in science, by, 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 by eliminating any doubts that exist, even using common logic, basic common logic, he will bring all of his listeners to the conclusion that the Torah is a met, and then his philosophy is once he's eliminated doubt and he's shown that the Torah is the met, you must accept it. You must follow the mitzvot. But in order to prove it, he, he goes through a lot of obstacles. The rabbi argues with anybody and everybody who has a point to make, a question, even I've seen, I've seen him have a, a debate with a priest. So the rabbi is very, very convincing. He's very unique. And Baruch Hashem, we're very zokhe to have him here tonight. Before I introduce him, I just a quick, quick uh, thank you to those who participated in organizing tonight. Everybody, the food, um, people who participated in the food is very much appreciated. We wanted Rabbi Mizrahi to come and to, for this to be a first class event because this is Avatura and everything in Avatura has to be first class. Um, as well, uh, the um, Holy Bagel restaurant, the whole family, they are unbelievable. When they, when they heard Rabbi Mizrahi was coming, they stopped everything to make sure that the food and that the ambiance would be perfect for him. 
Um, as well, at the end of the shiur, the rabbi, one of the favorite parts, I think, that he has is that he takes questions. So anybody, you know, who has something that comes to mind, who has a question they want to talk about, you'll have your opportunity. Don't be afraid. The rabbi, he can handle it. I've seen it. I've heard him handle very difficult questions, so bring it on. As well, uh, there are CDs at the back of the room which have been offered. Um, they're unbelievable CDs. They, um, if you're driving your car, instead of doing nothing or listening to the radio, you can learn something, and it's very easy listening. So I definitely recommend people take CDs, and if you want to go a step further, not only to improve yourself by listening to CDs, but by sponsoring CDs for other people to listen to. The CDs are $1 each. It's the most inexpensive Torah classes you can get, uh, and it's the most inexpensive method of spreading Torah. Um, it's a great investment. With that said, uh, without any further ado, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi. Oh, all right. <clears throat> Thank you, Adam. I'm very, very happy, very, very happy that uh, since I arrived to Florida at, on Friday and had the beautiful Shabbaton, and then on Sunday two lectures, and today two lectures, and all the events were full of people. I spoke for about seven and a half hours on Shabbat straight. Nobody moved. Everyone was happy to learn. And we had an event on Saturday night full of people. No, there was no room. And over here, Baruch Hashem, very happy to, to see uh, the place is full. It gives me the strength to continue, to see that it's Baruch Hashem, it's keep going. And we reach audience new audiences that I actually never reached before. From here, Bezrat Hashem, as soon as I get to New York, a week and a half or two after, I got to London for the first time, to England. And there's also going to be a lot of events like here. But the people here are extremely wonderful. Uh, if I have to start thanking all the people who helped me from Friday until now, that would be the lecture. <laughs> So please, everyone knows what they deserve. Baruch Hashem, and Hashem pays everyone what they deserve, with extra bonus, of course. We will try to make this lecture entertaining, and I would encourage each one of you to ask me questions, even in the middle of the lecture. I don't mind. And of course, in the end, I'll give more time for uh, questions. Today, 3,323 years after the Jewish nation stood in Mount Sinai, Millions of people for the first and last time in history heard the voice of the creator of the world for one or two minutes. That's it. It wasn't more than that. The actual show took longer. But the actual moments that God spoke to people in public, it happened only once in history and only to the Jewish nation. No other nation. We have 7.4 billion people in the world. The Jewish nation is the smallest one, only 13.2 million people, that's it. The whole world is around the Jewish people. You hear about them all over the news. They are the, 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 the top Nobel Prize winners in every field, in science, in uh, advisors to every government, treasuries, scientists, best doctors in the world. Just like God promised in his Torah, my children are blessed in everything they do. However, the relationship between me and my children is a little bit or a lot different than all the other nations as we're going to exam soon. For the first and last time in history, millions of people heard the first two commandments from the Ten were given publicly. It wasn't the original plan. The original plan was to read, to speak the entire Ten Commandments. However, after the Second Commandment, the nation of Israel got so panicked and so scared that they started to beg Moshe, it appears in Parashat Yitro, which we're going to read on this coming Shabbat in a shul. Remember this when you hear it. They begged him, please, 
you go up to the mountain, speak to this God, whatever he will tell us, we're going to listen. But we cannot tolerate that event. It's too scary, it's too much. We're dying from fear. You ask, okay, there's a loud voice coming up from heaven. It's a very, very loud voice, but you know that it's not uh, an enemy. You know it's not something that is about to hurt you. What's the problem? Why are you so nervous? The answer is, the Torah says the floor was shaking, like an earthquake. And there's a noise of shofar, sirens getting louder by the minute. And the mountain is full of fire and fog. And then such noise, they just couldn't take it. So they said, we can't hear this voice. So Moshe answered them, don't worry. God is not here to arm you. He's only here to test you. Are you going to be faithful to the covenant that he's going to make with you now? Or are you going to betray him? Please remember that this event is taking place seven weeks after the exodus of Egypt. Seven weeks. From the time we came out of Egypt until we received the Torah, 49 days. The nation of Israel went to Egypt, Jacob went to Egypt with 70 people all together. 210 years the nation of Israel were in Egypt, 83 years of it they were slaves. They work approximately 16 hours a day, the hardest job you can think of. But it wasn't just a physical torture, it was a mental torture. They made the men work women's jobs, and the women did men's jobs. And obviously, they were killing their children and all the other things that the Torah described. So it was like, uh, like Auschwitz, a little bit different. That's exactly what they had to go through for 83 years. This is after Yosef, the treasury of Egypt, passed away, and he was forgotten by the Egyptian people. And after that, slowly, slowly, they started to think, tomorrow it's going to be a war, these strangers will join our enemy, make revolution, and they occupy Egypt. And Egypt was like United States here today, the center of the culture, the center of the finance, the strongest empire, many, many cultural different cults and religions over there. There's a freedom of religion, as the Torah described, that the Kohanim, in Hebrew, when we say Kohen, we mean a grandson of Aaron, the Kohen, which means a servant of God, the royal family of Moshe and Aaron, Moses and Aaron. But when the Torah say Kohen, it's not necessarily a Kohen from the family of Aaron, it's any kind of Kohen, even among the Gentiles, an idol worshiping Kohen. That Kohen, Itro Kohen Midian. Itro was the pop of that generation. And then is the, mo the most legendary Baal Tshuva in the history that made repentance and dropped his idols and came to convert. And the merit that he had, that his daughter Mary, the greatest person ever lived, Moshe. He became the father-in-law of the most important person in history. Why? Because the harder the tshuva is, the repentance, the greater the success that the person has after, in this world and in the next world. I'll give you an example of what I mean. A few years ago, maybe eight, nine years ago, I met a rock star from San Diego. A rock star. Yeah, a real rock star. It's thousands of people come to his band concert. A Jewish boy, his parents are Israelis, but he grew up in America. I was born in America. He has a band, and uh, Capitol Records, they signed a contract with him. He's about to be a millionaire. Young guy, thousands of people scream, throw themselves on the floor when they come in. You know, all these rock stars. And now, it's very difficult to take a person like this that is 20 years old, is about to be the, one of the most famous people in America, perhaps in the world, musician, a guitar player, and the band is about to make it, and take him out of there and make him a from Jew that comes to Yeshiva and learn Gemara all day. What are the odds? I started to talk to him, and I started to build his understanding that he has the potential to make a huge impact on the Jewish world. 
He has skills, but he has to use them positively, not in a negative way. Slowly, slowly, I spoke to him. One day, he left a letter just days before the contract was signed. He left the letter to the band. He didn't know how to tell them because he's the lead singer. Without him, the band is worthless. He took his stuff and he came to Monsi to the yeshiva. And he said in the Gemara, it was very difficult for him to get up in the morning. I had to wake him up personally. And I used to be very aggressive with him because I knew that if I'm giving up this guy, it's a really great loss. So a day, and another day, and another day, very hard efforts. And then he became Baal Tshuva, and later he became a speaker, he goes, he gives lecture, he made Aliyah to Israel, he started to give all kinds of lectures and make other people fall. I always told him, you, I really admire. Oh Hashem, I have plenty of people like you that became religious, but you I really admire, why? Most ordinary people, what are they giving up in order to become a servant of God? What do they do? They have a job, ordinary life. Not such a bad thing to be a religious Jew. After all, it's a wonderful life. So it's really not such a sacrifice. But a person that in his mind had a dream that he's aiming to this dream all his life, and he finally achieved it in the hardest moment when the desire is burning, the fire is burning, the fame, the glory, the ego, the money, women, all kinds of things that he had in his mind to drop it in the highest moment of his career, supposedly, the most important, the key moment, and leave everything and come and sit and learn Torah. How many people like this did it? So I told him, your reward is much, much bigger than other people. Why? Because other people do not have to sacrifice nothing compared to you. And that's what constantly kept him in until he finally settled down. Same thing he told. He gives up everything. He's the master of Avodah Zarah. The whole world admire him. He, after he hears what happened to the nation of Israel in Egypt and the miracle God did for them, and the ocean split, the Red Sea, and they went through, and the Egyptian drowned, and Egypt collapsed, the biggest empire in the world until that moment, ever, collapsed from a small nation of three million people, slaves, with no rights, with no army, with no nothing. Think about it. And the whole world is rocking for this little group. He realized something is not right here. We are in the wrong direction. So he made a turn. And he went and converted, and Hashem paid him big time. There's extra chapter in the Torah name after him. Forever. In a million years, when this world will be over, when all of us will move to a spiritual world and there's not going to be any physical world anymore, the Torah will always remain and his name will stay there for eternity. Why? One of the biggest Balei Tshuva ever. There's no limit to how much a person can reach. The potential is huge. Most of us underestimate ourselves in a time of trouble, in a times of, of stress, we can do a lot more than what we can, we can imagine. What people did in the Holocaust, nobody before that ever believed they can do. People were walking for three days barefoot on snow. If we walk one minute on a deck in New York on the snow, the, the legs become blue, no blood circulation. An hour later, the legs are numbed. It's like paralyzed. Our people did it. Stories of people testifying, they walk for three days with no food after they were already 45 kilo, 90 pounds, and they walk for three days just to survive. And this has led my lectures to Turkish. They started to become Shomrei Shabbat, many of them, and some of them started to go to yeshivot in Israel, and some went to Ranana and opened the yeshiva there for themselves. They made a Turkish community there. I went there, so they told me, if we have a hundred people, we'll be so happy. If, if we'll have, thank you. If we will have a hundred and fifty, it will be a miracle. I arrived to Istanbul, to the Hilton Hotel. Four hundred and fifty people came at one in the afternoon until eleven at night. And you know what's the difference between the Americans to the Turkish? 
The Americans come, wow, beautiful lecture, nice. Some will make a change, some move on with their life. He came from one ear and left the other ear. Same thing Israelis, most of the people. But by them, it's not like that. After the lecture, I was sitting for three hours, shaking one hand after the other, that they promising me they start keeping Shabbat. They cannot say no. It's the greatest job to be a Mekarev in Istanbul. Everyone, you promise me Shabbat? You understand what Shabbat is? Yes, Rabbi. That's it? Shabbat 100%. No? Okay. And they kept the words. 450 Turkey, the biggest event in the history of the Jewish community ever in Turkey. He erased that lecture. Huh? He erased that lecture. Don't worry, I have it in the computer. Relax. I was just left in the camera because I love that lecture so much. So every night when I come to give a lecture in New York, when I set up the camera, I see the face of the guy that announced the lecture in Istanbul, it gives me energy. Because I remember the Kiddush Hashem that we had over there. We were doing it with six Turkish Muslim gunmen protecting us around. Because you know it's dangerous over there. You have three gates by the shul, three gates. You cannot walk, you walk into one, they close it, then they open the next one, they close it. To be a Jew in a country like this. Okay, let's move on. So, so, there is a saying in life, and it comes from the Torah, according to the efforts, that's how the reward will be. In a world of 80,000 religions and cults, believe it or not, more than 80,000 religions and cults. If you want to write an article, how many religions are in the world, you will be 70 and you won't finish your list. Everyone claims they have the truth. The Buddhists, they claim they have the truth. The Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians, Hare Krishna, and all the rest. What do they say? Our way is the right way. Who was the first one? The Jews, 3,323 years. The Christian, 2,000 years. The Muslims, less than 1,400 years. The Buddhist, Buddha was 2,400 years. Hinduism, it's not a religion. They never claim they got anything from God. They just believe in all kinds of things. They have different gods, people. Each person become a hero. So really, they're not claiming that God ever gave them anything. It's a way of life according to what they decided to do. And all the rest, all of them came after the Torah. There were always cults before the Torah. The Torah described the idol worshippers always before the Jews received the Torah. So it's not a contradiction. But the first time ever the world found out there is a God was when the Jews heard his voice and the old world heard about it. H how the Gentiles knew about it? We find that before the Jews entered the land, 40 years after receiving the Torah, they sent spies. And the spies say, among them Rachav, she was a prostitute to Neretz Israel. She said to the, to the spies, everyone here is shaking from what about to happen because of you. Because we all know what you did to the Egyptian empire. How did they know? There was no CNN. No Facebook. Today, before you sneeze, they already ad advertise it in Facebook. <laughs> Today, you want to publish it, you don't want to publish it, nobody asks you, it's there. But in those days, how did they know? There was no communication, no television, no radios. Why? The Chachamim is teaching us, Hashem published the acceptance of the Torah to the whole world. The whole world was rocking and shaking and freezing from the surprise that God came for the first and last time to earth to speak to people. Now I know some of you, maybe the first time you hear me or the first time you hear a lecture, you're probably wondering what nonsense this guy is selling us. Do you, does he really expect us to believe that God spoke to the Jewish nation? 
And if the Christians will make up that lie, then we would believe them? But I'm not telling you you have to believe. When you ask a priest, how do you know JC fed 500 people with the loaf of bread? Son, you have to believe. You're not allowed to ask questions like this. This is all about faith. You ask the Muslim, tell me, how do you know Muhammad did this and this and that? Bismillah, kill him. Why are you asking questions about Muhammad? You come to the Jews, how do you know God spoke to Moshe? Prove it. No. How can we prove it without a doubt? Did you ever ask yourself this question? Maybe we're wasting time. Maybe we're grinding water. In Hebrew, there's a say, tochen mine. Take water and grind it. Seven years later, you still have water. Why? What did you achieve? Nothing. So let me tell you something. We are the only religion that can be examined scientifically and leaves no doubt. One time I had a lecture in Great Neck. Ram, I think you were there. It was in Barzida's house. We had about 200 people there, and all of a sudden one Persian guy brought the controller of New York State. The most powerful person in New York State show up in my lecture. A professor for history, a friend of Kennedy, all the money of New York State under his signature. The police, the FBI, buildings, taxes, pension funds, everything. Very powerful person. He comes into the lecture, and he asked me questions for 45 minutes, but real good questions, brilliant person. 45 minutes debate in public, not planned. Surprised me with questions. It was very difficult argument because he was a brilliant person. He knows a lot of history, so it makes it even harder. By the end of the lecture, I said to him, well, Mr. Havesey, what do you have to say? He said, I still have some doubts. I said, great, we made a great progress. In one and a half hours, you became a complete atheist. Now you have some doubts. Let's sit and clarify your final doubts. So he said, of course, sure. I said to myself, you know, politicians, they tell you whatever you like to hear. But 10 days later, his representative called me up. He said, what about what you say? He wants to sit, with, to meet with you. We went to a place, three hours, one-on-one. -on -one. Questions, answer, questions, answer, like this, three hours. By the end of the three hours, he said, that's it. No more, I don't need proofs anymore. You just proved to me, I never believe it's possible to prove a religion scientifically. I always thought there's a medal of faith, and that's what most people think. Today, I have no doubts that we, the Jewish nation, is Jewish, in case you didn't realize. His grandfather was a Satmer Hasid. And he's way far from Judaism, completely. No, no connection at all. So he said to me, today I know 100%. I wish I met you 30, 40 years ago. Now I'm a lost case already, 68 years old. Where will I start? Just to show you that three hours back and forth, that's it. He and he became a complete atheist. One lecture and another three hours. Within four or five hours, it was a done case. And that was a hard challenge to argue with him because most people don't know 1% of what he knew. It was a very hard challenge. But he did not have one question unsolved. Let me explain to you how we know. And the next time someone asks you, how do you know the Jews received the Torah in Mount Sinai, you will never have a doubt and you'll know what to answer. First proof is, if I come to you today, so many people here, and I say to you, God sent me, he gave me a book, I am the representative, and all of you have to listen to everything I say. This is the book of God, read it. Is it possible for me to describe in the book what happened to all of you as a nation in the last 12 months in details? and lie to you in your face, or you know what happened to you or not? Can I fool you? Can I say, I took you out of Japan. You were slaves in a jail in Japan. I came with the machine gun. I shot all the Japanese. I got you out. We brought an Israeli airplanes, the commando. We got you there, and now you're in Florida. <laughs> now, if one of these details did not happen, 
What would you say? No, another night we lost from our life, poor guy. You know, fine, let's move on. It wouldn't take me serious, right? If one of the details, even if you're really in Japan, and I say I came to Japan, but you say I brought you to Florida and you're not in Florida. So then you say, how can God make such a mistake? He tells us you were in Egypt, you were slaves. I took you out of Egypt. I made all these miracles for you. I split the, the Red Sea for you. You went through, your enemies drowned. I'm giving you bread falling from heaven. One month after you came out, the month started to fall. Waters is moving with you. And many other miracles. 100 miracles are described in the Torah. Each one of them is against all odds. Almost impossible to believe such a thing can happen because it's against the law of nature, blood. Every drop of water in Egypt was all red, blood. Billions of frogs. Every firstborn fell and died in a minute. You don't find things like this in the, in the world today. So now, when you come to a group of secular people, which means people with no religion, they do whatever they feel like. Most of the people in the world are like that. And you want to turn them into religious people in one day. What are the odds that millions of people will turn from free people with no religion, with no God, with no nothing, into fanatic followers of the book that you hold in your hand? What's the odds? Sometimes you show a person hours of proofs, hours and he still goes back to his normal life, doesn't care. So you showed him everything, still doesn't want to change. How is it possible the entire nation turned into something different than what they were? Now when Moshe comes to them, and he said to them, your eyes saw that I spoke to God. It's written in a book. So they opened the Torah scrolls, which Moshe just brought it to them from the mountain after 40 days. And they open and they begin to read. You were slaves in Egypt, I took you out. They confirm, yes, it's true. We went through the water, it's true. We have bread falling every day, true. We saw blood, true. We heard the voice of God, true. One person from the millions will raise his hand, excuse me, Mr. Moshe Ben Amram, you know we love you very much. You're a nice person, but stop hallucinating. We were here, we were with you for years already together. Not one second in our life we heard the voice of God. What are you selling us a story? You're coming here and you say, all of you, with no exception, heard me speaking to God. That's what the Torah says. They would agree to receive a book claiming to be from God if the book said they heard God and they didn't. Right away they would say, it's a lie in a book. God does not make mistakes. God does not make lies. It's not supposed to be that way. That means it's not from God. Leave us alone. End of story. But it gets much better. When a person comes to fake a religion, he wants to create a phony, fake cult. What's the reason that a person would, would create a fake religion? What's the, what's the reason? One. He wants to be memorized as a leader of a nation. In history, to be the king, that's one reason. Second, money, big business. If you control a nation, everyone has to give me 10% from their income. It's billions. Power, control, manipulation. You think you're the smartest. You want to be memorized in history as a legend. What else? You're mentally sick. It could be many things. Now tell me what, if I come and I want to fake a religion, would I write in a book that I'm stuttering? That everyone in history will remember me? Ah, 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 ah. That's what I would write about myself in a book that I claim God gave me? Of course not, right? Second thing, when a leader gains control on a nation, what's the first thing he always does? Take care of his friends, his buddies, his children, his uncles, brothers, sisters, everyone get a job. No? Look in Israel. Soon as somebody comes into office, all his cousins all of a sudden became important people. What? That's how it is. Gaddafi, Saddam, Assad. They put their own people right away. 
they replace everyone. Why? This is the way the world is. The leader gain control, the leader decide who he wants in power, people that are faithful to him. Moshe gained control. He gave the land to the entire nation of Israel. The only family who did not receive any real estate in Israel is Shevet Levi, his own family. Everyone got real estate, billions of dollars worth today. The family of Moshe, nothing. Not only that, Moshe said to them, God gave me this Torah. From now on, no one allowed to touch his aunt. Your father has a sister. You are 22, she's 20. You like her, she likes you. You decided to get married. Perfectly legal before the Torah was given. Cousins getting married until today. In the old days, uncles, an uncle can marry the girl. Or, you know, uh, uh, you have an aunt. She's the sister of your father. You can marry her. There's no restrictions against it. All of a sudden, when thousands of them are married to their aunts and have many children, many, many children, Moshe is bringing them a book, commanding them to get divorced. Why? Until now, you could live with your aunt as your wife, happily married, everything is beautiful. But from this moment on, the Torah says, You cannot touch your aunt. You have to separate. And, and the Torah says, the Gemara says, Everyone started to cry. Wow, what a tragedy. The Gemara says, every mitzvah the Jewish nation receives with happiness, it's a blessed mitzvah. And every mitzvah they cried will always have problems with. Mezuzah, mitzvah with lots of luck. Almost every Jew in the world has it, even the ones who declare they don't believe in God. Brit Milah, circumcision. It's a very interesting mitzvah. What normal person has a baby today and takes scissors and cut his ear? What do you do, Moshe? Shh. Shh. Cut his ear. What would happen to him? 20 years in jail, no? People who declare there's no God, God forbid. We don't believe in Torah. Religious people are crazy. Tomorrow they have Brit Milah for their children. I sent a letter to Tommy Lapid was a person in Israeli Knesset that hate religion. I said to him, according to your declarations, you have to be in jail for the rest of your life. Why? Every interview he ever gave was against religion. There's no God, there's no Torah, there's no, there's no, there's none, there's not. So one day he has a son, Yair, who took his place today in the Knesset. And this Yair was circumcised on the eighth day with Mohel, Orthodox, with blessing. So now, if you declare it, the Torah is nothing to you, it's a piece of napkin, based on what you took an innocent baby and cut a part of his body. How? How is it possible that all over the world, America, Europe, Japan, everywhere you go, the Gentiles allowed the Jew to take an innocent baby and cut a piece from his body. If you cut his ear, it will be the end of the Jewish people. It will be the end of us. If we all now imagine we try to change the Brit Milah to the ear, or we cut the, uh, the toes, or anything like that, a piece of skin from anywhere else in the body, what would happen in America? It will be the end of us. The whole world accepting this very strange mitzvah, circumcision. And the people who hate Torah, they circumcise their babies. That's mitzvah with mazal. Sex crimes, they started to cry. Relation problems, until today, that's mitzvah with no mazal. Most people sin in this category. Mitzvah nida. The Torah say, you want to be happily married for the rest of your life? I give you the secret. What's the secret? When a person eats steak every day, it can be the best steak ever. The first day, he enjoy it 100%. The second day, 98%. The third day, 95%. The fourth day, 90 Fifth one, 70 After a month, not only is not enjoying it, when he see you serving the beautiful Argentinian steak coming to his table, oh my god, 
please, not again. Eat. No. They showing him a video. Look at you. Two weeks ago. <laughs> give me, give me more. No, give me, I'll kill you, give me. What happened after two weeks? <laughs> I can't smell it, take it away. Why, every day you want to vomit. That's the way a person is. Hashem say, listen, I made you. I made the law of physics. The law of physics is, is a world of illusion. The entire physics is an illusion. Do you know that? If Hashem will remove his supervision from the creation, and the movements of the atoms would stop to move, this entire earth become the size of a gun. Those who understand physics will confirm this to you. I heard it from a big scientist. He said, this is all an illusion. He gave me an example from a fan. When a person is hot, like me, I'm always hot. So a person that is boiling now, he's putting the fan on. The fan has four arms. The faster it moves, the bigger the illusion is. When it moves very slow, you see four arms are rolling. But when you press number one and it goes very fast, it looks like a whole circle, full. You don't see that it's four arms with space in between. The movements of the atoms are so fast that it creates a material illusion. It's an amazing thing. And Hashem says, in this world, all the physical pleasures are temporary. Why? Because it's not the real perfect world. The real perfect world would be when the soul exit the physical body and go for life of eternity, as you can watch in my DVDs, Life After Death. I show many, many proofs from the scientists and parapsychologists. I give you my commitment here tonight. And every person that will watch this DVD, Life After Death, any kind of doubt you ever had, you will never have it ever in your life. It will be more clear than to prove to you that it's night outside. That's how easy it is to prove Life After Death. Without any doubt. Without any doubt. Yesterday, I gave a lecture, Baruch Hashem. By the end of the lecture, the owner of the house showed us a picture. What was the picture? The lens, the lens of the camera works in a much, much faster frequency than the eyes of a person. We cannot see spirits in space, but they're all around us. The Zohar, the Kabbalah say, if a person had one second an opportunity to see what's around him, he will never be able to function normally ever again. It will destroy him mentally from images, spiritual images that he cannot see in normal eyes. But the lens of the camera can detect things that you cannot see. Also, animals have different frequency in the ears. They can hear things in the space that we cannot hear. They hear, they react. We do not hear anything, complete silence. So the owner of the house went, he was in a car with his son, and it, someone took a picture of him. And in the middle of taking the picture, his aunt, from years ago that she passed away, complete clear picture of her. Every wrinkle of the face came out with colors in the camera. A woman that passed away years ago. Who was last night in the lecture? Is it true what I said or no? Yes. Right? You saw it, right? 100%? I'm not exaggerating. There was only two people in the car. You take a picture, three people showed up in a picture. What? Unbelievable. Everyone got goosebumps. I almost fainted when I saw it. And now, it's not a stranger, it's a relative. I gave lecture life after death. I show more, more than 30 pictures like that. But this is real. It's someone that you know and his relative. It's even more convincing. But I didn't need that proof. I mean, I gave a lecture about it. It's very easy to prove that the real life will begin in a time of death. Most of the Jews in the world do not even know it. They think, achol veshato ki machar namut. Eat and drink, enjoy the moment, because tomorrow anyone will die. Grab as much as you can. Well, when a person realizes after watching a two hours film that actually everything we do right now, it's only to prepare the real world that will never end, who cares about here? I'll give you an example. A person wants to be a truck driver. So they tell him, you have to learn how to drive. 
take some lessons, pass the test, and we'll give you five minutes road test in a big semi-trailer. So he agreed. He comes now, and he gets, it sits in a semi-trailer, and the tester sits right next to him, and he said to the tester, oof, I'm dying. Why I don't have AC? So the tester said, the AC is broken, I'm sorry. He said, tell me, why you don't have leather seat? It's not comfortable. Can I take it back? No, it's stuck. Tell me, why the wheel is so hard? And my nice Mercedes is very soft. So the tester said, that's the way trucks are. Why the mirror is so big? I'm not used to it. So the tester said to him, tell me, you genius, how many years you plan to spend in my trunk? Before you even drive, the test would be over. So why are you so worried about the truck? You should be worried about the 60 years coming up, your career as a truck driver, and all the money you're going to have, and what truck you're going to have. That's why you have to focus. Why do you care about the five minutes here? It's a blink of the eye. The Gemara said this world is a blink of an eye. Blink, and it's over. It looks 60, 70, wow, it's long. And you take a person eight years old before he closes his eye permanently. You tell him, Grandpa, here is a pen, here is a paper. Write to us conclusion of your life. Conclusion of your life. How many pages he will fill? One, two, three, five, 10, 20, that's it. That's his whole life. Seven years of life, five pages. I went to school like this, I got married, I have children, I have this, I got a job, I made money, I bought a house, bought another house, I replaced 15 cars, that, I was sick, I got, you know, I had a surgery. What can he write? What is he going to write? How many times he went to the bathroom? How many steaks he ate? How many times he played golf? He's not going to write it. No, it's nothing. He will write a substantial moment of his life. One page, two pages. One Jew was 70 years old. No, no, God forbid, he got the cancer and he's laying in the hospital fighting for his life, very depressed. It's an epidemic today. Unfortunately, every 10 minutes I get a text. Pray for him, pray for her, pray for him. Tell him for this, tell him for this, for that. <laughs> yeah, I get extra depressed from how many tragedies are happening. So he's laying in a hospital and he was a very successful businessman. So he was able to put aside $100 million cash in his bank account. But he's seven years old, and the doctors give him one week to live. So as he's laying there depressed, and people starting to come say goodbye to him, all kinds of friends, all of a sudden, a Chinese doctor showed up. Excuse me, Mr. Moskowitz, I have good news for you. What? Look, show him a little, bit, a little glass with some liquid, purple liquid. What's this? You drink it? One or two hours, you're out of the hospital. Brand new, no cancer. The eyes of the Jew lit up. What? Give it to me quick. <laughs> the Chinese say, wait, wait, wait. What are you, normal? The lawyer jump out of the closet, sign here, sign here, sign here. By the time they finish to sign, they won't be able to drink. So many signatures. What am I signing for? You're wiring. We check your financials, you have $100 million. We're transferring $99 million. Look how generous I am. I'm leaving you $1 million to live. $99 million to my bank account in China. But you're out of the hospital. How long you would live? We don't know. Maybe a week, maybe a year. We don't know, it's a, it's a gamble. Most of the people are afraid to die. I've seen people moments before they die, moments. It's a very scary moment for those who stand near. A few times in my life it happens. People call me, come, go to the hospitals. You see how people scared. Even a big rabbi, I once was standing next to him a few days before he passed away. Every person who walked by the hospital, he was calling them Jews, non-Jews, it doesn't matter, religious, not religious. Come give me a blessing. So I asked him, why do you care about every person who walks by to give you a blessing? So he said, you don't know what the merit of every person that stands in front of you. Just because it doesn't look religious doesn't mean it doesn't have a big merit. Maybe it's a big sponsor of yeshivot or CDs. A person can give a lot of money for CDs, it's not even religious. I have few people like this. 
I have goyim, Chinese, European goyim, even some Arabs who donate money for, for CDs. Why? Because they already heard in my lecture it's the best investment in history. Because every person who becomes religious from your money, all his mitzvot forever and ever, and his children comes to your account. So look at that as investment, smart people. So you never know, if you look at this person, he doesn't even look religious. Maybe thousands of people keep mitzvot after 20 years, thanks to him, he has very big schuyot. He can give you bracha, chaz shalom. you know, if you're supposed to leave this world, he can get you out of there. So he was, he was calling a lot of people, give me bracha, you give me bracha, you give me bracha. So maybe one of them, Hashem is, he owe him something. And thanks to him, he'll get me out of here. Hashem saved Lot for Abraham, not for Lot. Lot was supposed to die. Hashem said, I cannot do it to my servant Abraham. Go and save your nephew against the king who captured him. So the Chinese doctor say, sign here. He gave him 99 million, and he came out of the hospital after drinking the drink, and Baruch Hashem is healthy now. He left with one million. No, he has to manage. What can he do? The question that I'm asking, a person comes in front of Hashem. Let's say he lived a few more years. He's standing in front of Hashem. And Hashem says to him, I don't understand. I gave you 70 years of life for free. You didn't have to pay 99 million to live. I gave you life for free. And all you did is burn it to the garbage. And when you were about to lose it, 50 years of hard work to gain this $100 million, and in the end you gave it, maybe you will buy a week of life. When I gave you 70 years for free, you did not appreciate it. It's worth trillions. You took it for granted. You burned it on sport, television, scenes, gossip, sleeping, vacations, eating, running, whatever you did. But you did not touch your soul one minute of your life. Now when it's about to be too late, you woke up, it's maybe a little bit too late, my friend. This is the message here. So going back to what I started to say, a Jewish nation is different than all the other nations. By them, it's a matter of faith. You have to believe and there's no proofs. By us, the Torah does not want you to be a believer. The Torah wants you to know God. Everywhere God comes to his Jewish children in the Torah, you should know. You should know I'm your God. For the entire world to know that I am the God here. There was no God before me. There will never be one after me. There's no one under the earth. There's no one above the heaven. Every move you make, I record. There's an eye who watch over you. There's a he who listens to you. And everything you do is registered in the book of God. What's the creation of a human being? God created men sent from the ground, and he blew a living soul in his nostrils, and he became alive. And what's the opposite? And the soul returned to the master who, the master who gave it, and the body will return to the ground because that's where it came from. Book of Kohelet, King Solomon. How do you know life is body and soul, and the soul is everything? And the soul of Rachel, Rachel, came out, and Rachel died. What's death? What's death? Not the heart stop beating, the brain stop working, eh, all kinds of things like, no, no, no. The soul came out of the body, the systems in the body are collapsing one after the other. The soul goes into the body, the person is alive again. According to science, if a person is dead more than six minutes, even if he comes back to life, what we call clinical death, he will never have memory ever again. Everything should be blank. But today we have an incredible cases that people were dead for 40 minutes and more, and they come back to normal life, even though the brain was not working for 40 minutes. No oxygen goes to the brain 40 minutes. No breath. The body temperature dropped. The body is cold as ice almost after an hour. If you take a cigarette and you burn his hand, he cannot even make a beep. The nerve system is completely eliminated. All of a sudden, he opens up his eyes, and he begins to scream for the burning. 
When the soul wasn't in the body, the nerve system does not work. Person does not is, is worthless. A body of a human being in a laboratory worth 97 cents. That was 15 years ago. With inflation today, it's two dollars. Slice of pizza. Someone died, his parents sue for two dollars. Excuse me, judge. An accident happened. Tell them to pay us for the damage. So the judge said, okay, there's one kilo minerals, there's some salt, there's water, there's iron. You know, he, he looked at the ingredients of the body, two dollars, pain, two dollars. Anyone would sue? Why they sue for millions? Because they sue for the spirituality, not for the body. The body is nothing. The body is a shell of the real thing. The person is the soul. The soul is divine. The Torah says like this. The creator of the world was alone in space before he created the world and us. Alone. The kids, they ask their parents, Mommy, who made God? You ever heard that question from your children? <laughs> Mommy, who made God? Sweetie, you don't ask questions like this. <laughs> what is she going to say? <laughs> you don't ask questions like this. The answer is, God was always here. So the kid, if he's clever, is going to say, what do you mean always? Everything has a beginning and sometimes an end. It has to have a beginning. This table had a beginning, yes. The notebook, the microphone, the camera had a beginning. And the moment that someone made it, that's the beginning point. What does it mean it was always here? The question comes out of ignorance. Why it's ignorance? Because this question is legitimate only in a world of physical items and physical and material. This question does not apply to spirituality. It only applies to a physical world. Why? Time exists only where material exists. No material, no time. And I gave in one of the lectures a few days ago here an example of a person who goes to dream and he dream for nine seconds, the scientist says it's the longest dream. And when he wakes up, he said to his wife, six months of tortures. And his wife said to him, listen, you went to sleep at midnight, now it's three minutes after midnight. Can you explain to me how six months of suffering fit in three minutes? Conversations, the Hamas put you in jail, they torture you every day, they took you home, you know, you were starving for weeks. So his wife said to him, listen, it didn't even start snowing. What's wrong with you? How are you telling me all these stories? So what I'm telling you, this guy Mustafa had a mustache, all day was beating me up, driving me crazy. So she said, but I don't understand. You just told me a one hour conversation where he had with, with this Ahmed Mustafa. How did it fit? Yeah, sentences take time. What do you see? When a person goes to sleep, the Gemara says the soul comes out. When the soul comes out of the material world, time is not an issue anymore. There's no time. Therefore, since God is 100% spiritual and He is able to do whatever He wants with no limitation, and He created this world, and we're going to understand soon why, therefore, we should never ask this question when did it start, or God forbid, when it will end. This question applies only to creations, material creations. Like Albert Einstein said, time exists where material exists. But the Ramban, 700 years before Einstein, already wrote it in his books, but nobody knows him in colleges. They know Einstein, they don't know Ramban. But it doesn't matter, it's a fact. Time exists where, where material exists. That's why you don't ask. You don't ask about something that is above our ability to understand. Why? People translate life to many movements of time. Walking, it's time. Sleeping, it's time. Eating, it's time. Speaking, doing everything you do, writing, it's all time. If you take time out of the life of a person, the person doesn't understand anything in life. Nothing. Not how to do, not how to eat, not how to talk. Take time away. Nothing in life is worth anything. It's worthless. Time is the most, more, most important thing in our life to calculate, praying, kriyat shema. In Judaism, time is the foundation. If, I give you an example, the earth 
is going, the speed of Earth is 1,700 kilometers per hour. You drive your BMW on a highway, 100 kilometers an hour, it's about 65 miles an hour, that's the average speed, multiplied by 17. That's how fast the Earth is going around. So why are we not getting dizzy? Because it's huge, you don't feel it. And plus you don't see items. If the stars were very close to us and we see that it keeps going like this, it would drive us crazy. But we're very far from there, so it looks like a slow motion in relation to others. What happened, what would happen if Earth would slow down by 1% every 100 years? 1%. So in other words, instead of 1,700 kilometers, it will go 1,669 or 68. A person went and bought a hundred thousand dollars Rolex, and it's worthless. <laughs> you can never say the time because Earth is in a in a different mood today. It wants to move faster. What happens if it moves faster? Day and night change. You don't know when is the time of Kriyat Shema. Nine o'clock or nine o two or eight fifty eight. It's very confusing. Hashem made the world. The Earth is standing in space. Space. It's endless, space is endless. The, the Earth, we are the, one of the smallest stars. Imagine a dot in the middle of space. And this dot is turning 1,700 kilometers from the time it was created until now. It never, never moved even by a second up or down. But it gets even better. Let me ask you a question. If I come to you and I say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm in a very good mood today. I have a very rich friend, and we decided to give you a bonus here for coming here tonight. What's the bonus? We will give you a billion dollars. Don't get too excited. <laughs> we'll give you a billion dollars if you're going to pass the test we give you. So you say, OK, what's the test? We'll say, we're taking a quarter now. We go to the show of Miami from your terrace. We throw the quarter all the way to the water. And now the, the quarter sank somewhere in the middle of the ocean. And the test is here. We'll give each one of you a thousand quarters. And your job is to throw the quarter in the ocean and make sure that your quarter would land and the quarter that I threw. How deep is the ocean? 12 kilometers. So it has to go inside the water for an hour and land and the same quarter that I threw. And if you do it, I'll give you a billion dollars. What a generous guy I am. So what would you say? Any one of you would go and try to throw it? What happened? You're not excited to make a billion dollars? You know it's not possible, right? This is the story of Earth. It drives me crazy to see how ignorant people are, even when they are scientists sometimes. Why? Just think about what I say. Scientists say the world was created, some of them, not all of them. There are some scientists who believe in 100% in the story of Genesis. But we're talking about the ones who claim there was an explosion, random explosion, boom, everything was made. Billions of systems were created by itself, and all of them knew how to connect together and create a world. Just the body of the human being, you have thousands of systems, long, liver, veins, nerve system, bones, ligaments, Eyes, nose, air, oh, so many sophisticated systems. Each one of them, it's more complicated than the entire internet network or the entire computer network or anything you can think of is just the system. The brain of a person is one trillion connection, 10, sorry, 10 trillion connections in a little brain the size of an apple. It was created by a random explosion. 80% of that is water, only 20% material. The veins inside the brain, if you take one air out of your head and divide it by a thousand, that's, the, that's how thin are the wires inside the brain and they're connected in such a sophisticated way. If one of them will get disconnected, the person is in coma, he can't move. One out of the 10 trillion, so I say like this, look, you know we live in a Milky Way galaxy. There's nine stars, 
and they give the shape of a banana, an arch. There's nine stars, one, two, three, four, five. The Earth is one of them. If you know what I'm talking about, the Earth is moved to the right. It's not in the right track. You have nine stars, the shape of a banana. But the Earth, where we live, it's like a hand picked it up and moved it all the way to the right. If the Earth would be where it was supposed to be, in the same track, in one second, we will be all burned and nothing here would remain because it will be too close to the sun. The only place the Earth can be in space, space is endless. The only place that the creator of the world was able to put Earth in an endless space is where it is. No other option. Think about it. You have trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions until next year of options in space. And there's only one correct option. What are the odds that the Earth would be created by itself and will be put in the only place in space in relation to the sun? Coincidence? Who can think such nonsense? How can something like this would be created and be put exactly where it's supposed to be? It's not possible. If it would go towards the sun a little bit, or further from the sun, we freeze or we get burned right away. So the idea is like this. People say the world is millions of years old. How do they know? They don't have a proof. It's called speculative science. There are two kinds of science, objective science and speculative science. There are objective science that can be proven, like math. You can prove it. It's very easy to prove. If a person has a sickness, like headache, let's say, and they develop a pill, and every thousand people who take the pill, 990 of them get rid of the pain within minutes, that's a scientific proof that the pill does something to the brain. That's it. You don't have to argue. It's been proven. Anyone ever prove that the world is billions or millions of years old? Absolutely not. There are different ways they measure it. And obviously, every university came with different numbers. 4 million, 4 billion, 300 million. One thing I want to tell you. If there is a person here in a room, and we ask, how old is he? And each one of us say different age. 20, 21, 25, 27, 30, 40, 70. Is it possible all of us are right? Possible? Not possible. Maybe one is right, maybe no one. But definitely cannot be all of us are right. When scientists keep coming with different calculations, why would I waste time on it? Everyone comes up with a number. I posted in my website a great film by an American non-Jewish scientist named Robert Gentry. It's called Fingerprints of the Creation. He is proving that all these speculations are nonsense. And he's a great scientist. You should see how he goes one by one. This is a theory. This is a guess. This is contradiction. Everything. He does not leave any doubt once you see his film that the world is only a few thousand years old. Now you come and say, but, uh, we don't find scientists that say besides him that the world is a few thousand years old. Everyone speaks in millions. Let me tell you something. The scientists claiming based on measurement, that all the lakes are connected to the big sea, to the big ocean. And the lakes are always floating, moving towards the big ocean. It's like some kind of a circulation. And while they're moving, they're dragging minerals with them to the big sea. How much salt they bring into the big sea? 400 million tons of salt every year. 400 million ton. Ton is about a ref big refrigerator full of salt. Plus, it's a thousand kilograms, 2,200 pounds of salt. One box is one pound in a supermarket, those big bucks. 2,200 like this is one ton, right? 400 million multiplied by 2,200, this is the no amount of salt, huge amount of salt. If the world was only one million years old, you would not have one drop of water in the ocean. You would have a huge pile of salt from the bottom of the ocean all the way to the moon, to Hashem. Why? Multiply million times 400 million tons of salt, and you see how much salt. That's an end of argument. 
It could never be. So, why everyone is so anxious to prove that the world is millions of years old? Who cares? The world really began when Adam came into the picture. Everything before that is not relevant. There is a basketball team. They build a beautiful stadium for the players. When the player comes for the first time for the game, that's when the show began. Who cares how they made the stadium, how difficult it was to put the light? What do we care? The show begins when the player gets on the, on, the, on the court to play. Adam, Hashem puts him here. This is the way it works. When there is a creation, before the creation there is a reason. Before the reason there is a wish. The creator wanted something. The creator wanted people to hear the speaker loud, so he made the microphone. Not first came the microphone and then he decided what the microphone would do, no. First, I want to increase the, the sound. Then, how do I do it? And he begins to walk. Hashem wanted to create the world. What's the reason that he wanted to create the world? The answer is, he was alone in space. Alone. And he is the source of the ultimate good. The oral Torah explains it. The source of all good wants to share from his greatness to someone else. What is it like? A person is very successful in business. He makes so much money and he cannot have kids. So it bothers him very much. He say, what's all this money for if I don't have who to give it to? I don't have kids to buy them clothes, to buy them car, to help them with house, to, to, to send them to school. Well, okay, I can accumulate money. It's not worth a lot when there's no one to benefit. He comes, he buys his wife something nice, makes him happy. He see a poor person, he gives him food for the holiday, makes him happy. He does something with his money, he shares with others, that's the greatest pleasure. I remember when I was very young, I was 21 years old, I was first here in America, I had a bunch of clothes that I wanted to get rid of. So I asked someone of the neighbor, I said, what am I gonna do with this clothes? So they told me, you know where the supermarket is? I said, yes. So there's a box there, they throw it there and they give it to poor people. It was December, end of December, it was snowing. I walk one or two blocks with a big bag of clothes and then I see, just when I got there, a guy, an anjou, is laying there, I don't know, was sick, drunk, whatever he was, laying there. As soon as he saw someone is coming, oh brother, can you give me money? I'm hungry, food. So I say to him, here, I took a few dollars, I don't know, five, ten dollars, I gave him the money. You should see how he was crying from happiness. So he was so happy that finally someone gave him money, he was laying there on the floor, laying in a freezing thing. Someone gave him a few dollars, but I remember when I went there, I had tears of happiness. I remember so I asked myself, wow, I, how am I so happy for giving this guy money? I, I don't even know him. It's a wonderful feeling. You're giving? And you're happier than the receiver. This is a spiritual trait. And then we got it from our Creator, from our Father. So, so the Ramchal explained in Mesilat Yesharim that the purpose of the creation was to benefit others. So he created us that we will be the receivers. So everybody asks, okay, you created me to receive, but I'm not enjoying this world. 99.9% .9 of the people in this world are suffering non-stop. Rich, poor, healthy, sick, male, female, smart, foolish, everyone suffers. Stress, pressure, anxiety attack, divorce, problem, bankruptcies, pressure, wars, politics, terrorism, fatigue. No? How many people can say my life is perfect? My life is perfect. Almost no one. So the point is, if the Creator wanted to benefit us, how come none of us is receiving these benefits here? Okay. The answer is, because if He would give it to you without earning it, you would not enjoy it. Why? If someone gives you a donation to eat, here, here, take some money and buy food. One day, second day, third day, after a few days, you begin to, to be very embarrassed. 
not enjoying the money, you're suffering. Every time you receive, you suffer more. If you live by my house and I give you everything, after a few days, you offer to clean. All of a sudden, you became a cleaning lady. Why? Because you're suffering receiving for free. You want to do something to earn it, to deserve it. This is the human nature. So the question is, okay, Hashem did not want to give us charity. He wanted us to earn the pleasure. Why did he make the world like this? You should have designed me, like they say in English, a blood sucker, to suck the blood and give me as much as you can. I, don't want, I want more. I'm not embarrassed. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. More. It's not enough. Make me like that, and I'll enjoy, and everyone will be happy. Why you design me in such a way that if you give me free, I suffer? So Hashem say, I made a place of a test. I put your soul, the divine perfect soul, in a body full of desires, attraction to material pleasure, and the soul is the complete opposite. And life will be a battle between the body and soul. No. And if you earn, and you listen to me like the Torah says, I'm testing you every second. I'm challenging you. I'm putting all kinds of traps in front of you. I'm torturing you to see if you stay faithful to me or not. Why? That I will reward you in your end. This is the way the verse in the Torah is for those who understand Hebrew. It says, Ki Hashem etchem. I'm testing you all the time to see if you're going to listen to me and keep the mitzvot or not. What's the rest? To reward you in your end. When you finish your job in this world, the reward will begin. That's what the Torah says, Olam Abba, the afterlife. Or another place it says, I'm strict with you. Because I'm testing you. You still love me when I'm strict with you or not? You love me when I give you millions, it's, not, it's okay, it's obvious. When I take your millions, you also love me the same? When I Shalom, send you a sickness testing to see how you react, you also love me? Or you only love me, love me when you got a good job or when you found a good wife? This is the test of life. Now, if the Torah would not say, we would never know that's the purpose of life. Torah in Hebrew means instructions. No manufacturer ever made any creation without a manual book of instructions. You buy a laptop, there's a book. Television comes with a book. Car comes with a manual. Phone comes with a manual. Everything. Why? How am I going to know what to do with a laptop without instructions? Take me a million years to figure it out by myself. Is it possible that the most sophisticated thing, which is the world, and us, that Hashem created and He will not tell us what's the purpose of life when everything in the world was created for us? Is it possible, such a thing, that we would live like monkeys and we don't know what to do here and we only want to have physical pleasure and, then, and one day we die and we won't even know what we live for? Now let's think together. If a person does not know Hashem, and he doesn't know Torah, and he's trying to be a philosopher, he's trying to figure it out, what's the purpose of the creation? So a smart, secular human being, this is the right way to think, like a scientist. He said, there is a creation. That means there was a creator. Who is the creator? I don't know yet. I have to find out. So there is a creation. The more brilliant is the creation, it's teaching me about the ability of the creator. The greater the creation is, the greater it makes the creator. Did you ever see a creation without a purpose? One, in history. Did you ever see car as a purpose? Telephone as a purpose? Jacket as a purpose? Watch as a purpose? Paper as a purpose? Did you ever see something? Hey, hey, Isaac, why did you make this? I don't know. Just like that I made it. What do you mean I don't know? Even a picture has a purpose. A rug has a purpose. Garbage bag has a purpose. Little stereophone cups. Everything has a purpose. Even if it's one penny. 
There's not one thing that was made for nothing. So the scientists say, okay, so the world is brilliant. The brain is unbelievable. The blood, the water, the oxygen, the galaxies, billions of galaxies, all the movement that are not collides with another. What's the purpose of it? So he begins to think. So we know there is a superpower who made it. And he made me here. But why? So he begins to think. If the purpose of the creation to enjoy the life here, most people do not enjoy the life. It cannot be such a defect in a creation of such a superpower. Most people suffer. If the purpose was to be healthy, most people have at least one sickness, even a minor one. But there's no hardly anyone that is completely healthy. So that's not the purpose. If the purpose was to be rich, only 5% of the people in the world has money. The rest, you know, look at what's happening in Africa, in the Middle East. Most people hardly have food. So it's not the purpose. If the purpose was to get married, to have male and female and enjoy each other and have children, you didn't have to be a brilliant person with a soul. You can be at the chimpanzee. She comes to the safari, she moves her tail, he goes like this, the gorilla, and two minutes later they have babies. Yeah. So what do you need to be a, a divine creature with a brilliant intelligence? No. Chimpanzee, chimpanzee, together, babies, finish. They also enjoy life. If the purpose was to eat good, why an average person has to spend two, three hours to eat one normal food? What kind of a pleasure is this? He has to go, he makes $10 an hour in a store. Finally, he made $30 that he can buy himself steaks and some vegetables and now prepare the meal. So he has to go to the supermarket, he has to buy it, he has to clean it, he has to cook it. One minute he eats it, and then another hour he suffers in the bathroom after that. <laughs> so what's going on here? That's, that's a purpose? Four hours of work to enjoy one minute? Thank you, I'm not interested. Plus, the animals enjoy food. I, want, I sometimes come home two, three o'clock at night. I see a great menu on the driveway. Chinese, Persian, Israeli, whatever you want. The squirrels, they are confused. They don't know what to eat today. All the cats became very, they come, they rip the garbage bags and they eat. Now you say, I don't want to eat leftover from the garbage. What kind of pleasure is that? You don't want it because you're intelligent, you understand it's a leftover from someone's germs. And you feel horrible. But the dog doesn't know it. Look how happy he is when he saw a bone. Do you think he cares about germs? It's the happiest moment of his life when he sees something in the garbage. So for him it's great pleasure. He doesn't know. So what's the purpose without Torah? Let's put the Torah on hold. Everyone is trying to break it up. What's the purpose? What's the purpose? To travel? What's the one? Every eagle, I now I wear my window, all day I see eagles coming to attack me. Baruch Hashem, there's a glass. <laughs> I got nervous today. I, I forgot there's a glass. There's a lot of eagles here in Miami. Hawks, whatever. Yeah, so they fly all over. In one hour, they can see the whole world for free. They don't have to take their shoes off, stand on line, security, Kamir Muhammad, go back to the beginning. They don't have this. They don't need to pay $1,000 to go and to sit like sardine. <laughs> ah, beautiful world. So it's better to be an eagle if you want to travel. So what's the purpose? Sport? Oh, we found the purpose. To be an athlete. One little fish you throw to the ocean, he swim faster than you. Any animal run faster. Take a ball, throw it to the monkey, see how they enjoy it. You need to be a person to be an athlete. And the animals are doing it much better. So what's the purpose? There's no purpose. If you sit a million years without God in the Torah, you will never find a purpose. That's when the Torah comes and tells you, my friend, I'm putting you in a test and it will be shorter than you can imagine, a blink of the eye. Wake up before it's too late. Read my Torah, read my instruction, observe the Sabbath. It's the eternal covenant between you, the children of God, the nation of Israel, to me. Eat kosher, put tzitzit, live with your wife, with tarat mishpacha. I gave you an example about the steak. If you eat it every day, you vomit. 
So Hashem knows every physical pleasure, no matter how great it is, you vomit from it after a while. You cannot stand it. So what did Hashem say? Do it, stop. Do it, stop. Do it, stop. It will nev you'll never get tired of it. This is the secret of this nida, that every 12 days, you have two thirds of the month they can be together, and one third of the month they have to take off to renew the cycle and the desire. It's very critical for the marriage. I hear that here in Miami, the marriages of the people are suffering tremendous crisis. Now you say, okay, the world don't even know what marriage is. What do you expect? We're not talking about them. We're talking Orthodox people. People who walk an hour in the humidity for the shul to go to the shul. People who give a lot of charity. People who put tefillin and come three times to Minyan. People who keep Shabbat. People who put their kids in yeshivot. Still, their marriage is awful. Not because they're bad people. He's a nice guy, she's a nice woman. He may be righteous, she may be righteous. You, you evaluate both of them, it's still not working. The divorce rate is climbing tremendously. The, 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 the marriage system went bankrupt completely by the secular and the non-Jewish world completely. There's no point of getting married. It's really foolish when the statistics show more than 75% divorce rate. Why taking the risk? We still have a chance not to fall into these numbers because we have the tools to do it right. They don't have the tools to do it right. That's why it's falling after six months, sometimes after six days. One person in New York made a wedding to his children, one million dollars. He brought a tent with air condition to put thousands of people in a tent. Equipment, rented steam, generators, one million dollars. And they got divorced after a week. <laughs> Why? There was no preparation for the wedding. What do you think? A man see a beautiful woman, she see a handsome guy. How are you? My beautiful, eh? eh? That's it. It doesn't work like this, my friend. A, a marriage is entering to a lifetime partnership. You have to check, you have to make the matches before, you have to learn how to not make mistakes, not to wake up with the mistake when the problems begin. It may be too late. You want to get a job in a big company to be the CEO and you don't learn what your job is? You want to learn while you're working? Maybe too late. Hey, Rabbi, don't worry. We'll go to classes of Shlom Bayit. No, my friend, before. Before you buy the business, check the business. Before you go together with a partner into a partnership, make the right adjustment. Don't wake up when it's too late and the war begins. Of course, chas v'shalom. People have to be clever. Everything in life needs education. If I had the money and the time, first thing I would do is open a college. Which college? Don't get nervous. College for preparation for brides and grooms. Yeah. It would become a multi-billion business all over the world. How do I know? I get thousands of emails from Jews and non-Jews about this issue. It's such an epidemic that as soon as you decide to open a franchise, someone that has money is clever, is gonna make fortune. They charge classes, they open classes, a real college. People would flood the area. You say, classes six months before you get married. How to be a husband. Whole session. How to be a wife. The purpose of marriage. How you make it work. The psychology of a woman. Psychology of a man. The, the mission of a woman in marriage. The mission of the man. How raising children. Depression of after giving birth. Depression of the pregnancy. How you handle crisis. What things you're allowed to tell the parents, what things you're never allowed to tell the parents. There's thousands of details to create a healthy marriage. Nobody learns 1% of them, and then they wonder why there's so much problems. And again, most marriages fail not because the people are bad. So my friend got divorced. He's such a wonderful guy. You're right. He's a wonderful guy. And the girl, also wonderful girl. You're also right. 
But the matching was not done according to Hashem's wish. Not to talk about people who make sins before they get married and they lower their chances to be successful a lot more. Not chas v'shalom that is guaranteed to have problems. Maybe they have other merits who saves them. But it's lowering. Why? Because when you do something against the boss of the world, you have a boss in your company and you give instructions what to do, what not to do. You cannot come and get the job by making so many things against his wish and then hope that he will benefit you. Don't be, uh, don't be naive. You want the boss to help you, you have to make sure he likes you. From all the people in the world, he liked only Noah. That's why he saved him. And he gave them the responsibility to continue humanity. One person started a new world. The Jewish people started the same generation with the Chinese people 4,200 years ago after the flood. They are one and a half billion and we are 13.2 million people. Why is it? Intermarriage. 57% intermarriage in America, 80% in Spain, almost no Jews left. France, same story. Every other place you go, unbelievable. There are some cities in the world, the divorce rate is more than 100%. How can it be? <laughs> they divorce six times, six, four times, five times. They raise the statistic to 120%. <laughs> it's not funny, it's very sad. What's the purpose of life? It's very important to know. The life is very flashy. If you live in Beverly Hills, or in Great Neck, or in Old Westbury, or over here in Aventura, in some areas, you enjoy supposedly the material lifestyle a lot more than the average people in the world. But you forget that that could be a fatal trap of the evil inclination and the Satan has Shalom to destroy you. This is the words of the Ramchal. The Ramchal said a person who becomes addicted to materialistic lifestyle, it makes a huge obstacle between him and the spiritual creator. It's a huge obstacle. Naturally, he loves God. Naturally, he is grateful. He wants to be religious, to say thank you for everything you did for me. Thank you for making me successful. Thank you for giving me power. Thank you for giving me nice things. But it's very difficult to live it. Yeah, you know what you need to do. It's very hard to do. Very hard to pray. Very hard to learn Torah. Very hard to be in love with Hashem. Why? There's a rule. The more a person is falling in love with material, the less he's in love with Hashem. Because materialistic, and spiritual, it's enemies. It's the opposite. A person cannot go high in his spirituality while his materialistic addictions are growing. Only when the materialistic attractions are lowered, the spirituality are rising. There cannot be that both of them go up or both of them go down at the same time. It cannot be. Hashem say the rules. If you want me, you have to give up your desires and you have, to, not completely, still can enjoy life, still have a nice car, can still have a nice home, can still eat good, but don't make it an addiction. I know a family, very wealthy. They gave $100 million check to an institution, donation. So they're very wealthy, right? If they give such a donation, okay. They bought a house for $30 million. The house, believe me, looks like a house of a king. If you ask, what, who do you think lived in this house? The Queen of England. That's how beautiful it looks. In the magazines, you don't see houses like this. The maid in the house, the, the babysitter, not the maid. I made a religion through my videos. So she, once in a while, on my way to the lecture, stopped by, give me advice what to do with the boy. She's taking care of the boys there. So I stopped by, we became friendly a little bit. After they bought the house, I saw the house, I said, wow, how much efforts people invested in this house. They say, we're moving out. I say, why? So we're starting renovation next week. <laughs> I say, well, here? I look at the house, amazing. 
They say, yeah, we don't like the matching, so we have to redo the whole paint, and we have to change this, and we want to... I was dying to say something, I was embarrassed. I said, well, what's going on with their mind? <coughs> they did it. It cost them $5 million to renovate, and now they are more upset than before. It didn't come out the way, ah, oh, the builder cheated us. They begin to, they almost got divorced. I was called in a late time to try to save the family because of the renovation of the house. How sick a person can become. Not only they don't enjoy the money they have, it's a fatal poison in their mouth. Horrible life, depression, pills, Prozac. Don't want to come home, Bichlal. Why is it? Foolishness, ignorance. Nobody understands what's the purpose of life. Again, I'm not saying you have to suffer. It's against Judaism to torture yourself. You don't have to fast. You don't have to wear ripped clothes. You don't have to separate from your wife for the rest of your life. We are not Christians. They make up laws. We have the book of God. He told us, enjoy with your wife. Enjoy food. Bless me. Say thank you. Eat kosher. Don't be a pig, yes. Have a limit. Eat good, watch your health, enjoy a nice car, you drive, you go. Okay, no problem, don't be crazy. What I gave you is only one reason why I gave you so much. To buy mitzvot for your eternity, that's all. Nothing else. I don't need you to spend a billion dollars, no, no. I can live with a lot less. I gave it to you because you are a messenger to save my children. And my children are lost. And almost all of them disappear because they marry other nations and they lost. And their children are going already. That's it, they're not Jewish anymore. You have the power to save them. You're not doing me a favor. Only to yourself. I want to read to you what the Torah says about people who think that they're doing a favor to Hashem. Let's read to you, and we're almost done, and I'll give you some time for questions. It says like this. It's appeared in the book of Yov 35, 59, 54, sorry. If you made a scene, what impression you made on God? Did you change anything by him? Of course not. And your crimes against God multiply. Do you think you did anything to him? Do you think you changed his mood? Do you think he's upset? Do you think he got tired? Do you think it needs Prozac? No. You cannot affect him in any way. Ve'im tzadakta, if you're righteous, ma titenlo, what exactly you contributed to him? He's still perfect before he made you, and he's still perfect after he saw you righteous. Oma mimchai kach, what can you offer him? Money, he gave it to you. Gold, he gave it to you. Words, who gave you the, the power to speak? What did Hashem say to Moshe and Aaron? Who put a mouth to the person? They were afraid to go to Paro. I made your mouth, I'm going to put the words in your mouth. Relax. It's the verse in the Torah. The answer is, the Torah say, Leman yetav lecha ulevanecha ad olam. Everything I told you to do, for your own good, I don't need anything from you. You're not doing me a favor. You keep Shabbat, you don't keep Shabbat, I'm the same perfect God. You eat kosher or not, I'm the same perfect God. You marry an Anju or not, it's understand, perfect God. I gave you the tools and the directions how to succeed for eternity, not to destroy your eternity. That's what I gave you, for your own good. You're not doing me a favor. If you don't, you're not sure, you come, I'll prove it to you. I, I, I tell you, we'll finish with a story. One time I was sitting in yeshiva. In yeshiva, it's very noisy. I'm teaching a class of Gemara. One guy comes and he whispers in my ear. My friend is here. 
It, it was very difficult to bring him here to argue with you. So I said to him, what? He's a secular guy. So I said to him, bring him in. He said, no, he doesn't have yamaka. He's not going to come in. It's noisy here. You have to sit with him in a quiet place. So I said, well, the only quiet place right now is in a car. If you want to sit in a car, I'll talk to him. I say, yes. I go out. We sit in a car. We begin to argue. He's an atheist, but a wise guy. Some atheists, they're honest. They really ask to know. Most are deceivers. They only look for excuses. But he, as a wise guy, deceiving. So he comes in, he asks a question, I give him an answer, another one. Slowly, slowly, all the Hasidim who walks by, in this neighborhood you don't see secular Jews. So they see one guy, and they see me sitting and arguing, and the door is open because it's hot. So what happened? All of a sudden we have an audience around the car. Oh. And it's debate in the street. Debate in Monsi, in the street by the yeshiva. Oh. Two and a half hours after that, I started to get tired. So I say to him, OK, bottom line, after this debate, did I convince you the Torah is divine, yes or no? One thing this guy didn't know that I am, over the years, I became an expert in body language. I already see, by the way, the person react exactly what he thinks and what he wants to say. Sometimes people in the lecture, they're about to ask a question, I answer them. If you see, if you know my lecture, before he opens his mouth, I answer it. How do you know the question? No, I'm not a prophet. I don't read minds, nothing. Body language. From the way he sits, the way he moves, I already know. Also, at what part of the lecture he, he jumped. So I already know what I say to the trigger him. It's a matter of experience. So I looked at him, and I see that he's very nervous. Why? When he came, he was sure there's no God, no Torah, no real life, no reward and punishment, no nothing. After two and a half hours, I see that he's beginning to panic. Wow, I lived all my life in mistake. I see it in his body. So I, I already know I did the job. What's the point of wasting time? So I said to him, OK, listen, it's about time to finish. Just tell me one thing. Do you admit that the Torah is from God? Yes or no? He said, absolutely not. Not only you did not make me believe in the Torah, now I'm even more sure than before that it's nonsense. But I see his body is lying. So I said to him, so it's really nothing? Nothing, nothing, not even 1% chance, nothing. So I said to him, OK, you know what? Can I ask you something? He said, yes. I said, I would say a few words, and you repeat after me. And then I let you go. Fair? So you can say whatever you want. I'll repeat after you. So I said, I picked up the Torah, the Chumash. I said, in the name of the writer of this book, so he repeats after me, in the name of the writer of this book, may all the curses that appear in this book will come on you. Amen. Say amen. He looks at me. What? Are you cursing me? I said, I'm cursing you? You said this, this book is nonsense, nothing. So somebody, a human being who wrote it up. So what do you care? It's nothing. It's not holy. It's not divine. Say amen and go. If somebody come and give me the Quran, in the name of Muhammad, all the curses in this book would come on you, I would scream amen. What's the problem? Someone bring a toilet paper. In the name of the, uh, the holes on this toilet paper, what, what I'm going to care about, what he says? What do I care? The name of the writer of the newspaper. OK, also amen. The name of the creator of the world? I would faint before I say amen. Say amen. No. Say amen. No. You should see this. Oh, I wish it was recorded. <laughs> what happened in the end? Guess what happened? Never believe. An explosion of tears came from his eyes, and he started to cry like a kid. Like this, crying. You got me. You're right, you're right. OK, OK, you're right. <laughs> He's crying like this. Why are you wasting two and a half hours of my life? After 10 minutes, you are convinced already. The ego, that's why I always say to people, better than debate is CDs. 
In a debate, the ego of the proud people never let them confess. But when they're alone in a the house, they cry. One time I gave a CD to the guy, and he has a teenager daughter. So she didn't know her father is playing a game here. I said, watch it. You promise me, watch it. He said, yes. So when I came to him, I said to him, no, how was this, the CD? It was, it was OK. So his daughter, I guess she wasn't the smartest in the world. She said, Abba, what do you mean, OK? You didn't stop crying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't crying about this, you fool. <laughs> She came in the right time. I started to tell you in the beginning of the lecture a story, but we forgot to finish it. In the Holocaust, when the Nazis didn't have what to do with the Jews, sometimes there was no work. So they, of course, won't let them lay down. So they made them stand in the sun 17 hours a day. They stand like this. Everyone who moves, get a bullet to his head. And the people who stand near, if they look down, they also get shot. One Holocaust survivor in his 70s is going to visit a relative in Cincinnati. The relative is Shomer Shabbos. He takes him on Shabbat to the shul. They walk into the shul. Rabbi Silver from Cincinnati is following the new guest, taking a yarmulke from the box, put it on his head. He knows how to pray. He knows how to walk back, to go like this, Kaddish, everything. Speaks Yiddish. Well, for sure he was religious, this guy. After the davening, good Shabbos, good Shabbos, what's your name? Fischel. Fischel! He said to him, Fischel, I see you know all the halachot. What happened? He said to him, I was in the camps. So the rabbi say, and? He say, if you saw what I saw in the camp, you also would throw your yarmulke down. So the rabbi told him, many people survived in the Holocaust, and they stay very, very firm, very religious. Tell me what happened to you that didn't happen to them. So he said to them, the Nazis were making up stand for 17 hours. One day I stand in the first row, and my friend behind me tell me, Fischer, it's five minutes to Shkia, to sunset. Five minutes to sunset. So I whisper, so what happened? He said, we did not put filin yet today. 17 hours, he's standing from four in the morning until eight at night. And he's, all he's thinking about, not that his back is breaking, not that his knees are exploding from pain, not that he's starving to death, I'm going to miss Tfilin. It's a covenant between me and my children. How am I going to go one day without Tfilin? So he said to the rabbi, this is the level we were in, in the camp. There was one old man that he smuggled one pair of Tfilin into the camp. One pair. And no one had Tfilin. They took everything from us. He smuggled it somehow. And in order for us to put filin, he was charging us, not for free. So we had to give him half a cigarette, a potato. Everything had a value in a camp. People were bankers, were real estate tycoons, lawyers, doctors, brain surgeons, judges. They fight for, they fight for a, a button, a button that fell from a Nazi shirt. Button can be life and death. Button. If you see a button on the floor, you bend down to pick it up. Button was the most important thing in my life. It can give me another day of life. A potato someone will give me. This is what it was. Black market. Everything. So now one guy comes to him and says, listen, I gave you everything I have. I gave you my bread. I gave you my potato. I gave you cigarette. I gave you everything. And I don't have what to give you. Don't make me lose a day of tefillin, please. The guy, the owner of the tefillin, he said, no. No money, no tefillin. And everyone said, let him put. No, I lend him tomorrow he wants to come. So this official is saying to Rav Silver from Cincinnati, I'm standing over there and I'm thinking to myself, religion is all business. Religion is business. This is all liars, fakers. 
He doesn't let the Jew put fill in, I belong to this religion. That day I swore I'm done with this. I'm done. The rabbi told him, Oh Hashem was a clever rabbi. He told him your ears should listen to your foolish mouth. You just told me that hundreds of Jews came in a freezing weather at five in the morning, standing on lines to give the last piece of bread that they won't lose mitzvah filin, even though according to the Torah, they don't have to put filin. They get the reward automatically. Anus Rachmana Patri. You're dismissed. They, any second they get a bullet to their head, putting filin, shaking, not to meet Shema Israel. Hundreds of Jews gave their life for Hashem, for the truth, because they knew life is not here, it's life of eternity, they don't want to lose it. You did not learn anything from them. From the one wicked one, you learn everything and you destroyed your eternity. The old man got the shock of his life. Right the way he got, he got the point. Started to cry. Rabbi, you're right. You're right. I'm a, I'm a liar, I'm a faker. It's all lies, excuses. All the guys gave their lives. You did not get impressed. An American Jew getting on a plane from London to Israel to go to pray in King David Hotel between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Next to him sit a secular British man named Maurice Schechter. Secular Jew and a Hasidic Jew in the same seat on a plane from London to Israel. What is the Hasid gonna do? Talk to the secular Jew, maybe he will make him some religious. So he said to him, did you put fill in today? No, 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 I'm done with him. He showed him the number, Holocaust survivor, I'm done with him. So the Hasid doesn't give up. The entire flight, nothing helps. Then when they go for the luggage, he, he lost him. The, the Hasid looks around, oh, he disappeared. Wow, why I didn't write his number when we go back to London, I would call him. Okay, it's gone, it's gone. He goes to King David Hotel. They bring the best Ashkenazi cantor, Hazan, to pray between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur for 10 days to all the rich people in King David Hotel. Every year like this. The Hasid goes there. On Yom Kippur, the Ashkenazim has a custom. They take a five minutes break. People who have parents, they go out to the street. And they make a score for people who are orphans. They make special prayer for the parents. The Hasid is a young Hasid. He goes out. He said, let me take a walk here in Yerushalayim, one block, to breathe some fresh air. They're fasting. He walks one block. He sees Maurice Schechter sitting on a bench eating sandwich in Jerusalem and Yom Kippur in the middle of the afternoon. Maurice, it's you. Again you? How did you find me here? I'm right here in the hotel. You're eating on Yom Kippur on the street? Why are you surprised? I told you I'm done with him. Why are you done with him? It, I told you on the plane. He took my only son. The day they kill my son, I'm done with him. So he said to him, Adraba, it's an opportunity now. They're making special prayers for the deceased people. Come make a prayer for your son. He said to him, no, no, no. Forget I told you I'm not, I don't believe in these things. Come, come, come. Throw the sandwich to the garbage. Come. OK, I come. He followed him to the hotel. They walk inside. He said to him, come, come. Everyone looks at him. He doesn't dress like a holiday. He said, please make a special blessing for his son. He died by the Nazis. So he said, what's your name? He said, Moshe. Maurice is Moshe. So he said, what's the name of your son? Chaim. So he said, Misha Barach. He said, no. I'm Rachem al kol briyotav, we achus, we achmol, we rachem, al nefesh, ruach, un shama, shel, Chaim ben Moshe. So he said to him, Chaim ben Moshe, what? Since when the Chazan asked for the last name? So he said to him, Chaim ben Moshe, Shechter. 
The Hazan scream. Ah! All my life I'm looking for you. I made it. I survived. I didn't know where you are. Fain, they put, they brought water, put a little bit on his face. Get up, Maurice. Ah, ah, all my life I hate Hashem for nothing. He saved you. Started to scream, to cry. The entire shul crying in the middle of Yom Kippur in King David Hotel. Not only his son survived, became a big rabbi and the best chazan. We blame Hashem, we complain, we are not satisfied when He gives us everything. And even when it looks bad, we don't understand that it's preparation for greatness, for eternal, for wonderful things. We blame, we blame, we blame. I will finish with one encouraging story. There used to be a singer named Shlomo Karlibach. Shlomo Karlibach, very famous singer. Uh, he was making concert and many American secular used to come and through his music they made tshuva. He, fla he flew a lot, every two, three weeks he's on a plane to a different destination. He sits on a plane and he see a woman named Kathy. Kathy is not a Jewish name, Kathy. She takes a sidur on the side, to the hairs. She works for the airline. In the middle of serving the customer, she stands on the side and prays Shmona Esri. Karli Bach says, Goya prays Shmona Esri? That's very strange. Then he sees she's ex extremely nice to him. Like, you know, she sees Chassid, Peos, Kiyamaka. Okay, sir, can I help? She said, tell me, I saw you praying over there. She said, yes. You Jewish? She said, I'm in the process of conversion. I'm converting. Rabbi, maybe you can help me. Said, of course, what do you need? She said, listen, I have a boyfriend. He's Jewish. We love each other so much. We have a dream to get married. But you know, I'm not Jewish. And I'm converting. And I keep everything. And his parents are not so religious. Believe me, I'm more religious than them. But they don't want me. Because... They are Holocaust survivors. And after what the Germans did to them, they don't want to hear from Goim anymore. That's it, they had it. They say, converts, not converts, please leave us alone. We're not interested. Because of that, we can't get married. Maybe you convince them and tell them that a convert is not a German. Okay, give me the number. He takes the information. She gives him also her home number. She lives by her parents. He goes to this hotel and he called the house of the guy. His father picked up the phone. He said, Shalom Aleichem, my name is Shlomo Karlibach. Yes. Can I help you? Yes. What? I was on a plane, I met this girl, Kathy. She's, you know, a girlfriend of your, of your son. And she asked me, she begged me to help. Maybe I can convince you to let her finish the conversion and marry your son. Ah, Rabbi, please don't get involved. It's a very delicate case. We are Holocaust survivors. We're not interested. Thank you for your efforts. Not interested. We don't want them. We don't want. So he called her house back to tell her that they are not interested. Her father picked up. So he picked up the phone. He said, hi, my name is Carly Bach. Yes. He said, can I speak to Kathy? He's not, she's not here right now. Who is this? I am a person that was on a plane. Da, da, da. She gave me the number. I tried. I want to give her a message. It wasn't successful. Rabbi, please, we don't want them. Don't do anything, please. Leave it alone. They don't want us. We do not want them. So, Karli Bach said, I'm very sorry, Chaval. It's a shame that a couple that love each other so much. And she's she really such a righteous girl. So he said to him, Rabbi, I want to tell you something. She doesn't know that we also Holocaust survivors. <laughs> we never told her. Because we didn't want her to know she's Jewish and she suffered like us here when we came here. So he said to him, you're Jewish? He said, but nobody knows it. Please don't tell anyone. So he said, OK. He hung up the phone. Right away, he called the father back. You're not going to believe what just happened. 
I just found out she's Jewish from birth. They're not telling her. I promise you, I'm not lying. So he said to him, okay. If that's the case, what reason we have not to want her? She's a wonderful girl. <laughs> Can you come to my hotel tonight, 9 o'clock? Where is it? Yes, I come. They call them up. Listen, they say they're very sorry. They want to meet with you. They want to ask for your forgiveness. And they want the marriage to take place. And now this time it was Kathy. Abba, what is that? OK, let's go to the hotel. Shlomo Karlibach is waiting in his hotel room. The family of the guy showed up. Five minutes later, they opened the door. The old man look, comes in. Two old people look at each other. Like this, silent. Fischel? Nachman? You alive? Begin to cry, to hug each other. Yeah, once Carly Bach standing there, everyone was crying. Why well, how they know each other? They took out their numbers. They bought Survivor. He said, we used to learn in Yeshiva Hevruta. Oh, wow. And one day the Nazis came in. They took him and they took me, and we never saw each other. But before it happened, we swore to each other with a handshake that if we will survive the war, we will do everything we can to marry our children. <laughs> and Hashem made the children meet each other. And she's Jewish all alone in a world of millions, billions of people. No supervision, no Hashem. Coincidence. Coincidence. Any questions before we finish? Before you faint. <laughs> I have more stories, but it's too, too much in one day. No? Any questions? Or let me give you 10 seconds for the shock. That's it? Yeah. Oh. You have an incredible memory. You remember everybody? You remember all these stories? I mean, how do you do it? How do you? When you speak 20 years every night, hours, you also remember. <laughs> Don't worry. That's nothing special. It's just a routine job. It's a you know the officers in a, in a city hall? You know how many names they remember? Thousands of numbers and names. They do it every day. That's it. No more questions yet? Okay, so I get that Hashem is really great and you want to share that with us. But why did he have to create this world? Why not just skip this world and go straight to Oh, so this is the question that we did not answer yet. Everybody asks, why Hashem did not create us in heaven? The answer, he wanted us to earn the reward. Because if he would give it to us for free, we would not enjoy it. So comes the next question. If that's the case, why he did not make us with the nature that we will take as much as we can and will never suffer? The answer is, Hashem did not create the soul. Hashem gave the soul a part from himself. Man de nafach, mi de leike nafach. The soul that we have, yes, the actual soul Hashem created. But the spark, the chilek eloha mi ma'al, the divine spark from the upper world, is an integral part of Hashem himself. Hashem take a spark of him and put it in Adam's body together with the soul. He merged it. And Hashem say, I'm perfect. You don't change perfect. You cannot touch perfect. It's perfect. Any change you do for good or bad is, cannot be for good. And you cannot move Hashem. Ani Hashem lo shaniti. Ve'atem bnei Yisrael lo chelitem. The same way you cannot change me, the nation of Israel will never be destroyed. This is the analogy. So the answer is, Hashem actually made us what He is. And Hashem is merciful, we have mercy. Hashem is grateful, we have gratefulness. Hashem, you know, everything, all the goods that we have in spiritual way comes from Hashem. Why? Because we have a chilek Eloha Mimal. And if Hashem would give us everything for free, we would not enjoy it, because this is the nature of God. This is his traits. Cannot change it. So therefore, he put us here to earn. Ratzah, Kadosh Baruch Hu, Israel, 
לפיכך הרבה להם תורה ומצוות. השם wanted to benefit the nation of Israel. Therefore he gave them lots of Torah and lots of mitzvot to do. Why? It's earning. I have another lead for you. Another job. Another job. Another... No, no, no. Too much money. Enough. No, no, no. Come, another customer. Come, another lead. No, too much. Nobody say too much. When it comes to the mitzvot, oof. Again? It's too much, Rabbi. Fanatic. You're too fanatic, Rabbi. Why? What's the problem? Huh? Once in a while, once a year I put fill in. Why has to be every day? You eat kosher? Only in the house. <laughs> no? That's what many people say. In the house we kosher. In the house we kosher. But when they go out of the house, they eat in a non-kosher restaurant. One guy, he told me, don't worry, I don't eat pork and no shrimps. <laughs> I only eat cow and, be, and, uh, and uh, the lamb. I said to him, in what restaurant? He said, over there. Or fish sometimes. Or salad. He's trying to give me things that sound kosher. So I said to him, where is the last time you ate? He said, in a Chinese restaurant in Main Street in Queens. I say, <laughs> one time I passed by the restaurant and I saw six Chinese guys in lunchtime sitting on the corner with a long cat without the skin, just the meat. It was roasted and they ate it with the hand like this, all sitting and eating the cat. Where do you think they cook the cat? In the same oven that your chicken was just cooked. What do you think? When you, when you eat chicken, sesame chicken in a Chinese restaurant, not kosher, the minutes before this chicken was there, they just put pork there in the oil. What do you think they cooked inside in this pot? What do you think? They eat rats, they eat cockroaches, they eat worms. Did you ever see what Chinese eat in China? One person with a bicycle and a barrel comes in the middle of the street. 500 Mr. Lee's are around him, give me. And they buy worms with a cup and they open up their mouth and they spill the worms to their mouth and you see the cockroaches coming in and out of their mouth and they push it in and all the blood comes out. A minute ago it was in your, in your pot. I'm eating only chicken, Rabbi. <laughs> okay, Rabbi, listen. The, the kosher meat is not juicy. When I go to the restaurant, I eat a steak, you cut it, it's like butter. It's so juicy, you don't even need a knife. When I go to the kosher, it's also okay. You don't know what steak, a good steak it is, Rabbi. I said, so you love the non-kosher meat? Say, yes, delicious. So I said, let me explain to you why it's delicious. When the Jews slaughter the cow, they slaughter the neck, all the blood spills out, but there's some blood inside the body. They open up the body and they put tons of salt. The salt takes all the blood and the urine out of the stomach of the cow. The Gentiles, when they eat a cow, they put many cows on a metal floor. They raise the voltage to 500 volt for a minute. The cows get electrocuted and they all fall on the floor. It's hundreds of cows. They all just got killed. It's called nevelot. It takes hours and sometimes many hours until they get to that cow to open it. In the meantime, all the meat of the cow is marinated in blood and tons of urine. Because the stomach is full of urine and it's marinated into the meat. It's like marinating the meat in, uh, in, in some sauce all night. It's in the morning, it's absorbed with a lot of this. And then when they cook it for you, it's delicious steak with the urine sauce. <laughs> so, ugh, you're disgusting. You're disgusting. So I'm telling you the truth. Everything I say, I check a million times before. Yes. Say when you eat unkosher stuff, it affects your mouth, but how does that actually work? Oh, very simple, I tell you. He asked, it says when you eat non-kosher, it's affecting the neshama. It's 100% right. When I was in the Israeli Air Force, I used to be in a place, a hidden place under the ground. That when they go above Israel, nobody sees it. It's, very, it's covered very good. 
And we used to put bombs and missiles on F-16. And we had a tractor that we had to go all the way up to the bunkers, bring the bombs and drive all the way to where the planes are and put the bombs and the missiles on the plane. The problem with this tractor that is only going 10 kilometers an hour, which is seven miles an hour. It's like running a little bit, you know, it doesn't move. Now when you walk 14, 15 hours a day, you're exhausted, you are broken to pieces like this for months. All you want is to finish that you can put your head down. So what happened? We used to take the tractors and put, instead of regular gas, F-16 gas inside the, inside the, tra the tractor. Now instead of seven miles an hour, it went 15 miles an hour. But every four months, the engine breaks down. So the, the Israelis say, what's going on? Man, this area, every four months, a new tractor breaks down. They put a detective and they found out. Same thing, non-kosher meat. Hashem made the world, he made the people, he put the soul inside the brain. And he said, the, the, the blood that goes into the brain makes the soul revived. If you put the wrong gasoline in your nice car, the car doesn't drive good. It needs the right gasoline. It could be a million dollar car, but the gasoline, which is only $10, 20 messed up the whole car. It just doesn't drive. When you eat non-kosher food, it creates the blood in your body. The blood is impure, spiritually, not physically. Physically, it can be healthy. You eat horse, horse is just as good as a cow, as far as minerals and vitamins. But it's against God's plan. Therefore, the blood that you eat, it's contaminated spiritually. And that's why it's very difficult for the person to connect with God, because the gasoline in his system is not good. When we make seminars, first day of the seminar, most people are anti-Torah. Second day, half. Third day, almost always, 20 years, they all dance with the rabbis. Which it's it. Now you tell me, okay, you did a very good job. You gave wonderful lectures with a screen, with proofs. They became religious, that's it, they saw the truth. It's usually that's the case, but how do you explain that people who hardly came into the classroom, they were sitting in the lobby playing with the laptop on the phone or taking care of the baby, they also dance with the rabbis. How? Oh. The answer is, when they're home, they eat taref, not kosher meat, three days in a hotel. First day, when they came to the hotel, they still have the blood from the house, from the non-kosher food. They cannot connect to Hashem. Second day, it's half and half already, because they already eat glad kosher for 24 hours. So right away, they, they ease, they ease the attack. The third day, glad kosher blood. Dancing with the Hasidish rabbi. Yesterday I wanted to kill him. Now he's dancing with him with tzitzit. <laughs> Without listening to the lecture. Why? Why? Because the blood changed the system. Right? The way it changed the person. We have in yeshiva people who come without proofs. Three, four days in yeshiva, they're already different people. No proofs. The Gemara, it's no proofs. It's hard learning. They already become religious without any talking to them. You have to do this, you have nothing. Just the food changing their system, they're already different. That's why it's one of the most important things. It's not the biggest punishment when a person eats not kosher, but it's critical to be connected to Hashem. I want to finish Bezrat Hashem. First of all, I want to thank you very much for sitting so long. I mean, when I come here, I try to stretch as much as I can. If there's any more questions, yeah, right here, please. Why did the Holocaust happen from a Jewish perspective, not from a German perspective, and why didn't the Shen stop it? Okay, so we have a question that it's a very common question. Why did the Holocaust happen to the Jews? After all, it was a horrible tragedy. Six millions got killed. The answer is, inside the Torah, God said to Moshe, one day you lay down with your fathers and this nation will betray me. They rebel against me. They will follow the Gentiles. They will neglect my Torah. 
I will be so angry at them, I will send these Gentiles to destroy them with no mercy. That's what the Torah says. So the Torah described a holocaust that will happen to the Jews when they leave God. Inside this verse, in my Torah and science film, you can watch it on my website, divineinformation.com. The front page, I put it. Watch it, I show the codes. In this verse, you have the word HaShoah, in equal mathematical skip of 49, seven times seven. Hey, 49 letter Shin, 49 letter Vav, 49 letter Aleph, 49 letters, hey, the Holocaust. In this chapter, when we enter all the German Nazis' name that relates to the Holocaust, all of them appears in the Torah in equal mathematical skip in the same chapter. Adolf Hitler in equal skip. Adolf Eichmann equal skip. Rudolf Hess equal skip. The Pitarona Sofi, the final solution equal skip. Ghetto equal skip. All the names that connect to the Holocaust appear in the only area in the Torah that Hashem said to Moshe that the Jewish people will rebel against me and that will be the price they will pay. Now, I know what you want to ask over there. You want to ask me how come religious people also died in the Holocaust? So the answer is, <laughs> listen, listen, listen. The answer is, why religious people die? First, you should know, in Germany, intermarriage before the Holocaust started was 80%. From every 100 Jews, 80 married Germans. That's explain a little bit what was the situation in Germany. There are many countries here in America, Philadelphia, other places, that it's the same thing. Almost everyone married go in there. So, you ask me, what about Poland? Poland, there were more religious. Yes, more religious than the Germans, but also there were tons of problems over there. This is what the Torah said. The Torah say, when a Jew can save another Jew from sinning and he ignores him, he's equally guilty like the sinner. Which means I see you about to eat pork and I look at you and I say nothing, I become guilty. I have to right away tell you, you know what you're doing is a very big sin. Why? Who said? What's wrong with that? You talk to him. 20% chance he will drop it. Maybe even out of embarrassment. You made him not do the sin. The religious people were religious for themselves. Nobody did kiruv. If you had a neighbor that goes to work on Shabbat and you go to shul, nobody did anything. Most religious Jews in the world are making a huge mistake. They only care about them and their children, which is very important to raise your children to be righteous. But the children of Hashem are just as equal as your children. And if you have the mouth and the brain and the money, mainly the money, and you do not contribute to save souls, you are guilty for their sins because you could have saved them. And you didn't care because you wanted to buy yourself all kinds of luxurious things which are not important. So you gave up saving souls for stupid things. One day Hashem would show you, you made a big mistake. That's why the religious people went together with them. And the Torah says clearly, there will not be any mercy there. I will close my eye. Aster, astir panay mehem. Al ki yomru en elokim bekirbenu. They dare to say there's no God. They took off their yamaka, took off their beards. They went to the non-Jewish court. They all violate Shabbat. They marry non-Jews. They eat not kosher. They say, we don't want Jerusalem. We want Berlin. <laughs> they wanted to change this Sidur. In a Sidur, it said, return us to Jerusalem. They wanted to change it to help us here in Berlin. That's how bad it was. And that's why it happened. Now, if it did not say it in the Torah, then I understand why people ask the question. But if God already told you it's going to be a day like this, so what's the question? He said, the answer. You go against me, you pay the price. Yeah, there's a lot of rabbis in the world who tell you all kinds of nonsense. Don't worry, you're righteous. 
you give money, you're tzaddik, it's enough, you're a Jew, you have nothing to worry. Where does it say it in the Torah, this nonsense? Where? Show me one place in the Torah that it says that a wicked person who doesn't listen to God, he shouldn't worry. He should worry non-stop. Non-stop. He's not, viol- he's not keeping Shabbat. How can he have a minute of rest? Not to keep Shabbat, the Torah says that soul get cut out of the afterlife for eternity. Do you understand what's going to be the consequences for a person who passed away? It doesn't matter how many billions he had. If he wasn't Shomer Shabbat, the Torah says, I'm cutting that soul from eternity. For what? For going on a boat on Shabbat? For driving to the mall? For smoking a cigarette? For talking on the phone? This is a reason to lose your relationship with your Creator? To be so ungrateful? And to lose your eternal reward life? We already saw in this world what Hashem is capable of doing. Hurricanes, tsunami, pogroms, missiles all over Israel. Every family has at least one cancer patient. Tragedies, children in drugs, people are depressed, half of the people. Holocaust one after the other. And nobody is waking up. No, no, no worry. Hashem is great, he's merciful. He will give, put you and Christine together next to Moshe Rabbeinu. Don't worry. Come on. So all the six million were wicked? Oh, now, first of all, I have news for you. Do you really think that six million Jews died? Think again. Oh. Many of these Jews marry non-Jewish women, and they have three, four, five children. If a person marries Christine from Germany and he has four kids, the four kids are Goim and his wife is Goya. So it's a family of six members they consider Jews. Only one is Jewish. The other ones are not Jewish. The Nazis kill much more Goim than Jews. Why? If in Germany 80% were married the Goim and they had children from the Goim, which means at least 80% or more were not Jewish. In Poland it wasn't as bad. In, in, oh, a little bit louder, what? Holocaust wasn't only in Germany, it was in Romania. I was about to say, I was, I was about to say, so in Poland it wasn't just, it wasn't as bad, because not everyone married a Goim, it was, it was intermarriage everywhere, but it wasn't as bad. But I explained to you that when the, when the Nazis were defeated, some, there were some survivors. So the Polish came with axes, and blew their head off with the axes. That was the end of it. So they asked them after the war, how did you not have mercy on these survivors that you blew their head off with your axes? You know what was their answer? We were so nervous that they will come back to control in Poland like it was before the war, we just couldn't allow it. So they asked him, why you hated them so much? They say they tortured us. They own all the businesses, they were all the landlords, they controlled the markets, the judges, the lawyer, everything, and they were treating us like garbage, deceiving us, cheating us, stealing from us. We just couldn't let it happen. So really what happened to these survivors after everything they went through, they died because of theft. That they came and killed them. You understand? Now one more thing I want to conclude. We do not know why God punished people. Only he knows. We can assume. We see a person does a lot of bad things. We can assume that it's because what he does. Sometimes a person can be completely righteous and he died very, very uh, young. And everybody asks, how come? How come he died? How come children die? The answer is you only see a person in one round of his life. It's reincarnations one after the other. Now, if you see a little kid, Five years old, such a cute kid, beautiful eyes, nice hair, sweet. Chas v'shalom get killed. It's a bigger tragedy than to see adult. Adult is very painful, but a little kid to get that cat killed, it drives everyone crazy, even strangers. Why? Such a cute, innocent kid. Why did he sin? He didn't even sin. So everyone is upset at God. 
How can you take such an innocent kid? How? So God said, excuse me, time out. He pressed play. And now you see who this kid was in his previous life 10 years ago. And you see Saddam Hussein gassing people, or Mengele, torturing them. People screaming from morning to night, torturing them. Hashem takes his soul, reincarnated in a new body. Innocent, beautiful kid. Maybe it was Hitler, this kid. Maybe it was Saddam Hussein. How do you know? We do not know who he was. How can we even make a comment on something we don't have the ability to know? You ask, you know there's a Jew, the Japanese put him in jail for 20 years. Why? Right away, oof, anti-Semite. They had Jews. You know, why do you know? Maybe he murdered. Maybe he was a drug dealer that killed many kids from his drugs. How do you know that he doesn't deserve the punishment? You don't know the details. We don't even know about ourselves what we deserve and, not, and what not. We know more or less what we did good and bad in our life. Well, we do not know what we did in our previous life. You know, I tell you something about me. I went to the autistic kid 15 years ago. Autistic kids is reincarnation. It's not regular people. After a few times I went to him, there's very holy souls. I asked him who I was in my previous life. Do you know what he told me? Now, this is the first time I think I ever say it in a lecture. You have the schut to hear it from the source for being so nice and patient. <laughs> what is it? He told me, you, you lived in Iraq, Iraqi Jew, and when the Zionists came to Iraq and opened a secular school, boys and girls, a hundred years ago, you went and convinced people from the yeshivot to go to the Zionist Israeli schools, which was anti-religion, communist. You made a lot of religious people go to the secular school. So Hashem gave you a chance to send you back to save souls, just the opposite of what you did. You understand? The autistic kid told me this. And I tell you one more thing. The autistic kid told me, I want you to bring your wife next week. So I said, what do you need from my wife? He said to me, your wife has a question that bothers her very much, and only I can answer this question to her. So I come to my wife, I say, I'm sorry, we have to go to Brooklyn, two and a half hours ride. She said, what? I said, the autistic kid invited you. <laughs> she was very nervous. She said, you have a question. She's thinking, what question I have? I, said, I don't know, don't mess with him, it's a divine soul. We went to Brooklyn. As soon as she walked to the hallway, to the house, before she sat on a chair. You know, they're not connected, you know. Yeah. They go like this, the hand goes like this on the leathers, they type. He said, hello, Mrs. Mizrahi. It's an honor you came to my house. Your granddaughter have a very big tzaddik. Like this. I wanted, believe me, it was a week after. He already knew who she is before she say hello, nothing. Right away, he started to type. And he said, I asked your husband to bring you here because I know there's a question that bothers you very much. So she's like in shock there. you always thinking my husband is running around so many years and making so many people religious. And what am I? A regular housewife, raising children, cooking, laundry. He's going to get in Olam about all the reward. And what's the difference between me and all the other religious girls? Same thing. So I want you to know that's not how it works. Everything the husband achieve, his wife get just as much. And Hashem put you and him in Egypt. They call America Egypt before the end to try to save as many souls as possible before time runs out. That was the end of it. I asked her, did you really think like this? She said, absolutely. Do you understand what's going on here? <sighs> Times is running out. And by the way, in that session, he told me the Arabs are about to attack Israel. The, the sky is black 
There are black clouds all over us. My heart is crying for what's going to happen. And the Intifada started right after. The Arabs exploded and their bombs, buses were going everywhere. He was already telling me this. And I took another, another man over there, a good friend of mine that was married. Now, nah, Baruch Hashem is happily married to a kosher woman. He was married to a woman, and as soon as he came to the room, the Otis told him, get rid of the despicable thing in your house. So my friend told him, I don't have a television. <laughs> he said, that's not what I meant. He said, I don't have any statues. He said, that's not what I meant. I don't have any magazines. That's not what I meant. I don't have any bad pictures. He's thinking, what does he mean? So that's not what I meant. So then he said to him, do you mean my wife? So he told him, your wife is not a wife. He's a wife of another man. <laughs> Think about it. He sits in front of him. So he looks at me, this guy. He says, I knew it. Like this, in fire. I knew it all alone. So he said, he said to him, your wife faked a get and marry you. Her, her previous husband never gave her a get. She took a person with phony ID to the bed din. It was here in Florida. Some kind of conservative bed din. I don't know exactly what the story was. If I remember, it was here or in LA. She came, they got married, and all alone she's married to another man who never gave her a get. You understand? This is an autistic soul. They know things. They're not like us. We have a free choice. We're in the middle of a test. They're already connected to Hashem in a very high level. You know, I've been speaking about these things for 15 years. Then I have critics. The more you're successful, the more you have critics. So my critic says on me, he's insulting the autistic kids. He hurts their feeling. He calls them wicked. <laughs> Everything the opposite. I'm the first one in the world who published them to the whole world. Everyone knows what they know from my lectures. It's all over about them. Most people didn't know. Yeah, there's some books about them. But people who never read the book, they learn it from my lectures. And in the end, they say he's putting the autistic kids down and hurting their feelings. Why? Because I say that they're almost perfect, that they have very little to correct, and they go to heaven? It's nonsense. But th by the way, I told you, the autistic kid told me, I suffer a thousand tortures a minute. So I told him, I feel very bad for you. He said, don't feel bad for me. Feel bad for yourself. I'm very close to my correction. You people are very far from it. Everything according to the Torah. That's called reincarnations. You see an autistic kid, how much he suffer, how much he's going through. You feel horrible. And in the end, he laughs at you. He says, <laughs> I'm 99% finished. I'm going to heaven soon, another year or two. You still have a long way to correct. It's the opposite. If you don't learn Torah and you don't know the secrets, you have millions of questions. The more you learn, the more you get answers. The more you get answers, it's easier to be religious. Ena ma'aretz chasid, the Gemara say, cannot be righteous without being educated in Torah. The only nation that to be an ignorant person is a crime is the Jewish nation. You can be an ignorant Muslim, it's not a crime. An ignorant Christian, it's not a crime. An ignorant Jew, the Torah says it's a crime. Am Haaretz, if I tell you what the Gemara says about Am Haaretz, maybe you run to the yeshiva for a year straight, all of you. But the Gemara speaks very strictly about it. Ah, that was maybe a sign that we have to say thank you very much and we'll see you soon. said for the Shabbat, what can happen? Why is there, it says, 